All right, so we should just turn our, our the video on there. I realize this is probably why it's taking a bit to reconnect is you, you do it right when you get in and then it shuts off, so you just have to reconnect. Okay. All right. Do you want to tell everybody? Uh, they, they're all looking at the note. They get cheat sheets. Okay. All right, so is everybody excited? How many of you guys are excited about The Chosen? Are y'all like, uh, y'all Y'all have got us. So you remember what happened there? We used the one clip from The Chosen. Hey, we kind of found this clip. And everybody in the room's like, yeah, dummy, we've watched it for two years. We're like, well, thanks for telling us. We, we are just, like, we are. Yeah, yeah, y'all are later. Uh, we are so stinking oh, sold. Yeah. So <laughs> what's going on? Stuff. So what's going on with The Chosen, as y'all probably already know, is this third season is about to start, but they're going to do the first two episodes in theaters. And so, of course, Meredith and I immediately got online and we got our five tickets. <laughs> so y'all better hurry up. <laughs> so then will they come out on TV? Yeah, yeah, they'll still come out on television, but they're going to have them in the theaters first. We just thought it'd be so cool to do that. And so what we're doing today is just showing the clip for it, because we know a lot of you guys watch it. The trailer. You're a little troubled. I am. Uh, you're losing something. I know what that's like. What time did you lose it? Time. I say to you, love your... Uh-oh, what happened? <laughs> I don't know. The wife's if you are really the one who is to come, or should we look for someone else? Go and tell John what you hear and see. Who is it? Did you stop? I don't know. I don't know what Stay up there. I'm Judas. I'll kill you. Nope. I have chosen you twelve. As my apostles. Don't feel any different. I don't need you to feel anything to do great things. What is stirring in your hearts? In the middle of such division and up. You know what we need to do is we need to do the whole have the have the church do a uh, come to me all who labor and are heavy laden and I will give you. All right, we'll just we'll go home and watch it. All right, go home and watch it. Watch the trailer. Go home and watch the trailer. But yeah, we should get the church to do it. Is that what you were saying? Like, yeah, yeah the church, or we do it at our home, or something like that. Everybody watches it together. I'm still going to the first two episodes. I must know we've already got tickets. <laughs> we are so fired up about it. When is the show? Uh, 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 November 18th. Oh, yeah, right now. Did you say, I'm sorry? Sorry. November 18th. November 18th. Where? Yeah, it's everywhere. It's like oh, all, all the theaters. theaters. Yeah, wow. they're all the theaters. So, anyway, so those of you who are into the shows and watch it, uh, if you've watched the uh, trailer here, there's a point that he says something in here in a local pastor uh, not I mean not like in Jackson but in Mississippi a, a Mississippi pastor got on one of the uh, the um, what you say, just message boards or something mm -hmm. or maybe in his own church and didn't like something he said I'm like what is he thinking and what it is and I just think it's a cool anyway when you go home and watch the th watch the trailer at the very end you can tell he's probably talking to not punched uh, who's who was the um, who was the priest? Who was the uh, it was Pharisee, but who was the priest that night at that, that, uh, that Jesus' first trial? Uh, I'm sorry. Caiaphas. 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 It's probably Caiaphas. I can't tell in the in the clip if it's Caiaphas, but I bet it was because it looks like that's where that's where, where that little clip was. It's probably Caiaphas. But he says he, he Jesus says he says if you do not Caiaphas says if you do not renounce what you're saying, we must follow the mosaic law, meaning threatening we're going to kill you. We must follow the Mosaic law. And Jesus, in his stern face, looks at it and says, I am the law. 
and I just go, ah, uh, that was just, ah. Uh. And I understand, if you understand, anyway, I, I don't want to get off in this, but this pastor had a problem with that. Jesus is not the law. But, but anyway, so he after it comes out, the we'll explain my take on that. I think, no, I think it's perfectly fine that he said that, because what did Jesus say? I did not come to... I mean, I got to to abolish the law, but to fulfill it. What Jesus is, is Jesus is the perfect representation of the law as it should be. That's what he is. He is what the law should be in its perfect form. He didn't come to abolish it. He came to fulfill it. And it's just an interesting concept. You can take it either way. Yeah, jump in there. If, if Jesus is the spoken word of God, and God spoke the Ten Commandments, and therefore, that's where right, that's that's right, that's right, that's I, I was going. The, um, he said it was something like that the Mormons say, and I didn't quite understand. Yeah, I just think he was running too far. It's like, just look at what the scripture just is. Take it for what it is. It's a beautiful Galatians concept. 14, 12, and 12, 12, 10, and 12, 17. Um, the Ten Commandments pop up again, obedience to them. And um, for some reason, we have this interpretation that we're no longer in the Ten Commandments. Scratch my head. Yeah. I don't know Actually, we're going to talk about that next week. That's exactly yeah. what we're going to talk about. Yes, yeah. so you're, you're exactly right. Yeah. Well, what it, what it is, here, here, and a matter of fact, I did this in our notes this week. See, I'm already way off. Yeah. What it is, is, and I always, you know how I love my term baby Baptist, as baby Baptist, we're so scared that someone's going to interpret what we say is you have to work for your salvation. We are so anti-work for your salvation, and rightfully so. But we're so scared of that, we don't understand there is work to be done. It has nothing to do with your salvation, your justification. It has a lot to do with your sanctification and how you live your life. Paul tells you over and over, he beats himself. He has to whip himself into submission so that he can please the God who has justified him already. There is a lot of work to be done as a Christian, but we're so scared that people will interpret that as you're saved by your work that we run from it so far that we do, we do a disservice of saying, yeah, there's a lot you got to do. There is stuff you have to do. Not to be, but the problem is we use the word saved. English word, that's not, we shouldn't even use that word. Because saved, they're bad, you know, three tenses of salvation. You are, you, are, you are justified, you are sanctified, and then you're glorified. So there are really three concepts there. And in English, we just say saved. Well, it's not, that's not true. Saved is not, you're not, you're not saved. You know why? Because you're saved, you're being saved, and you're going to be saved. Because there are three tenses to salvation. Your salvation is not complete. You're saved. You are justified. You're not going to hell. You are being saved from the power of sin right now. That's called sanctification while you still live in this realm. And then one day you will be glorified where you're saved from the very presence of sin. And at that point, your salvation is complete. You're not finished yet. Guess what the title of today's lesson is? Somebody read that out loud. Good enough. Already, but not yet. That's the concept. It's already, but not yet. This was not even in the note. The salvation is an already, but not yet concept. Your Bible is full of already but not yet concepts. There are concepts, illogical declarations by God himself that are fully complete but not yet. And it's a weird thing as an English Westerner to get your mind around that. But a first century citizen, not just Jewish, who wrote in Greek, it's very explicit all through the scripture, the scriptures, this concept of already but not yet. So if we look at that, I jump right on back into where we are. That's what it is. Your salvation is already, but not yet. And we're going to talk about two more of those themes. We better jump on it. Do we just skip the whole feast thing here? Mm -hmm. Ah, I knew she was going to say that because we want to get to this. Okay, here I'll give you the real quick shot of what the feast thing was here. Last week, as you know, Paul said, why don't we read verse, uh, because of 15, read, because of 15, you get 16 and 17. Let's just read that. This is review from two weeks ago. Because of, verse 15, disarming the rulers and authority, he has made a public disgrace of them, triumphing over them by the cross. So because of that, remember how we hammered that hard. You, because of, of, uh, of Jesus on the cross, he nailed this certificate of indebtedness uh, against you in, that, is, that is manifest in declarations. We talked about all that. It's been nailed to the cross. Because of that, you are now set free, so on and so forth. You've been brought into the family, and he's made a public disgrace of these powers and authorities, the supernatural world. So we, because of all that, you get 16 and 17. 16. Therefore, do not let anyone judge you with respect to food or drink or the matter of a feast, new moon or Sabbath days, 
17. These are only the shadow of things to come. But okay, the reality so, is in Christ. So Paul's saying, so don't judge by all these things. And what we we're going to do is just pluck one of those out to give you an example. One of the things Paul says don't judge you by is by these feasts. And we, I know the, the McLeese's know because what, 15 years ago, 10 years ago, whatever it was, we did a whole long teaching uh, on the feasts of Israel. The, the Jew, I don't like saying the Jewish feasts. These are biblical feasts. The biblical feasts, and what are those? Board. I'm yeah. sorry, no, they're on the board. Passover, unleavened bread, first yeah. fruit, Pentecost, Rosh Hashanah, Day of Atonement, and Feast of Tabernacles. And what we probably will do is, I don't know, sometime when it feels right in the next few months or whatever, we may grab that out, bring it up to date, and do it again. Because I imagine a lot of folks in this group probably haven't looked, haven't looked at these feasts. But what is Paul saying? He says these are a shadow of things to come. And if you grab what we were going to do, we won't move through this verbally right now, but the Passover. We're going to take a look at what Passover did. They practiced, the Jew practiced Passover for 1,500 years until that Passover was fulfilled in the, uh, uh, in the death of Jesus Christ. Now we look back and it's been two, 3,500 years, and that was a shadow of things to come, and it's a beautiful shadow. When you start looking at each one of these feasts, you realize they were exactly what Paul's saying. They were shadows of things to come. But what does Paul say? They are in reality. In the, reali the reality of them is Christ. And so we were just going to grab one and show you Basically, that's what Paul's talking about. Passover is death and unleavened bread, bread burial, and first fruits is the resurrection of Christ. And the, we you can go down this and just really see all the picture, the shadow of Christ, because Christ is the perfect Lamb of God, the Passover Lamb. Unleavened bread is buried, and first fruits is the resurrection. He is the first fruits from among the dead. Mm -hmm. So, all, that's a very high overview. Yeah. So, Paul was saying because of what all Christ accomplished on the cross, and the fact that you have now been brought back, and the powers and authorities that were placed over the nations have been have been dis not not destroyed yet. That happens at the end, but have been uh, what was the term we used last week? They have been. Uh, Disarmed. Disarmed, yeah, they were disarmed, and there was another term too we used. Uh, they have been, uh, I forget. But anyway, because that has happened, you're no longer judged by these things. They're a shadow, but the reality is in Christ. And then he goes on in verse 18 and 19 to talk about asceticism, false humility, a belief that to reach God and become more spiritual, spiritual you must abstain from worldly, com uh, worldly comforts and pleasures. That was one of the issues Paul was addressing, like Buddhism today. It's very much that asceticism is, is very similar to what you see in Buddhism today. Um, that's 18 and 19. And then in verse 19, he says, uh, you must be fixated on Christ the head. I like this statement. Not everything and nothing else. Don't get sidetracked with the shadow, the temporary, with the copy, with the dim reflection of the ultimate reality. That's what Paul's telling these Colossians. Is there's a lot of spiritual garbage out there that will sidetrack you. Don't get sidetracked with that dim reflection. Stay with the head of what it was all about, Jesus Christ. All right, I'm doing this super fast, y'all, because we're going to get to what we're going to do this week. Then you get to verses 20 through 23. All religious traditions, I'm not going to read the verses like we normally do. I'm just going to tell you the concept. All religious traditions, philosophies, secular psychology, will end. That's Paul's point. All this stuff will end. Great shit. <laughs> <laughs> it? Psychology Great shit. is my favorite. Yeah, Psychology. yeah, yeah. Just, just, a, just a, a temporary job. <laughs> I've walked away from a quarter of a billion dollars worth of education. Uh, because it's, it's, it's futility and hopelessness. That's right. It will end. And one ultimately, thing, it will one end. thing that Chuck Nistler always helps me with in this is he always used to say religion the actual word religio, I think, is to put on uh, the shackles uh, yeah, uh, 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 to, oh gosh, what, what was, was the word? How did he say it? Put, put, your, bondage. put yourself under bondage. bondage. That's what religion is. Mm -hmm. And we're going to read Hugh Ross next week, but he said in one interaction, a guy said, I'm not religious. And he said, neither am I. <laughs> <laughs> and that's what we're saying with all this. We can so easily get partial truths and get entangled into following the law or following feasts or following religious practices. Yeah, yeah. Um, 
all religious traditions, philosophies, psychology, <coughs> well, yeah, they are all only temporary. Verse 22, Christ is the culmination of everything. Again, how many, this is just Paul, he keeps doing it in Colossians. Again, how many ways can Paul say Jesus is superior to all things, which is the whole point of Colossians, the preeminence of Christ, he is supreme. How many times? That's all Paul's doing. Oh, your little son in one. Sound like your son down there. <laughs> That's all Paul's doing is over and over again in multiple ways showing you he is supreme than anything else. All right, let me get to here. Now, here's, I wanted to make this. This is going to be so good last week. But it's, it's good in the overview this week. <laughs> here's the practical question. Mm -hmm. If Paul is hitting on all this stuff that was a big issue in their culture, you think, oh, that's good, okay, I'm, I'm not really into Buddhism, I'm good there. <laughs> and you, know, you can kind of dismiss it if you get too specific on exactly what Paul was referring to, because he had specific issues he was addressing. Let's flip it into ours. Practical <laughs> question, what has an appearance of wisdom today? Because that's what Paul is saying. These, all these things have an appearance of wisdom, but they're not. So I'm just going to read you a few. Meditation without purpose. You see this crime being in the church these days. It's con contemplative <laughs> prayer and all that kind of stuff. Meditation without purpose, empty your mind versus deep Bible study, deep study. That is one of these things that has an appearance of wisdom, but isn't wisdom or biblical at all. Catholic vows of poverty and celibacy. That's if you're, if you're background of Catholicism. That's a thing that has an appearance of wisdom, but it doesn't. These are passing away. Dis, uh, mistaking social activities and this is something we do bad. Me, me, just generally evangelicals. Mistaking social activities and or community service for discipleship. Don't make that mistake. Social engagement and service is a wonderful thing. It's nice for you to do. That is not discipleship. You are not doing the Great Commission. You're not discipling anybody. Generally, I'm talking about general. And here's what Joel's quote is. Yeah. He always does. Always. An and atheist can build, build a habitat house. house. <laughs> and I added this this week. And a country club can entertain you. <laughs> Okay, an atheist can build a habitat house and a country club can entertain you, but only an imager of Christ can, can disciple one who has already been made a disciple, a convert. If you and you also always say, uh, we think about it with our kids, with the, our youth and our children, you can entertain, but you can never, never compete with Disney and all yeah. the entertainment in the world if you're not discipling them, then you're you're no different than that. that is, and you're going to lose that battle. So. Exactly. The distinction of the church is that we disciple you, not we. You are being discipled into the image of Christ, which is your one thing you're supposed to do until he gets you out of here. That is your mission. Everybody wants to know, what is the will of God for my life? Does he want me to take this job, that job? Does he want me to, eh, I'm down in the notes somewhere. Does, and, and all that's true. God, do, God does engage us on a personal level. The will of God, though, the overriding will of God and everything that he allows to happen to you, both good and bad, is to conform you into the image of the son he loves. That is the will of God. That's why the will of God for you ain't always fun, great, or happy. It's not what makes me good. It's what makes me look like him. That is the will of God. And if you are distracted from that, then you're distracted from the actual will of God has to be. Isn't that cool? Man, when I got that realization, I'm like, see, and, and please don't misunderstand me. I pray for God to help me figure out which house I'm supposed to buy next. <laughs> so it is that practical. <clears throat> but at a global level, that's not the point. Your God's will for your life is that you image Christ. And he's going to do whatever it takes in your life, good, bad, or indifferent, to force you to get his children to look more like him until the day that it's made for me, which is what Paul's talking about, we got to get to that. <laughs> well, okay, and Joel, you know, you look at James, he says, consider it pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know the testing of your faith develops perseverance, and perseverance must finish its work so that you may be mature and complete. Complete. Love why do you see saying all this is not fun stuff? It's not fun to go through trials, but consider it pure joy, yeah. because he's conforming us like Amen. Part of the joy is the removal of the um, presumptuous sins of uh, Psalm 19 and the removal of dross. Step off the top. Well, it's, 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 it's removal of dross so that we can be clean, mm -hmm. that one can be clean and one can be holy unto the Lord. Mm -hmm. Because otherwise, 
My sin nature separates me. His Holy Spirit fully and abundantly. And how did he do that? Through fire. Yeah, yeah. Well, he didn't just you eat, eat steel and you rinse it off. And um, and you eat it again, you feed on it. <laughs> and then you and then you temper it. And um, wow. the Christian the Christian walk is much more than the Southern Baptist tradition of teaching and training and discipling. whole concept that you get in a lot of your uh, Mark Harris Magnify, this whole name it, claim it, health and wealth and all that, and, you know, we, we've talked, we've actually talked about that in our worldviews many months ago. Yeah, I mean, there, that is simply not biblical at all. It just isn't. It just isn't. It drives me crazy. Okay. Where are we? Um, we gave uh, uh, other examples. Oh, yeah, let me hit these other examples <laughs> real quick. Place a community building over discipleship making, seeking sense, seeker sensitive gatherings. Not there's much prayer in Palestine. Uh, LG, and this is just a combination of things LGBT versus God's order, social justice versus God's justice, reproductive freedom versus the support for all life. See, all of these are concepts and philosophies, even religious activities, that have an appearance of, of wisdom, but in the end, they lead to self destruction. And the fulfillment of everything is in Christ. So, see, Paul, what Paul's writing, he's writing about specific issues to the Colossians. But those issues are smack dab in the middle of you right now. Same stuff. Don't get sidetracked by the shadow of wisdom. Mm -hmm. Stay with the one who is wisdom. That's what Paul's saying. Colossians, Colossians 2, 23. 23. Even though they have the appearance of wisdom with their self-imposed worship and humility achieved by unsparing treatment of the body, a wisdom with no true value, they in reality result in fleshly indulgence. Yeah, I love that. To me, what jumps in your mind there, the whole LGBT stuff. It has an appearance of wisdom, even an appearance of love and caring the way they spin it. But at the end of the day, it has to do with uh, fleshly, indulgence. fleshly indulgences. So that one is, to me is such a direct quote of, of similar to what Paul was addressing. Very, very interesting. Okay. We're now on chapter three. We were halfway through the book of Colossians. But now it's going to get big chunks of scripture, I promise. Probably not. <laughs> All right. So we are going to move to chapter three. Now, this is the already but not yet, even though I've just introduced it already. But not yet. Don't get that? Okay. All right. Already but not yet. A concept. And we're going to get to do a Greek spaz, and you know how much I love this. All right. Let's see. Where are we, Meredith? Already but not yet. This is a status change. That's what the already but not yet is for you. You have had a status change, but not yet. All right. Let's go. Colossians 3, 1 through 5. Therefore, if you have been raised with Christ, Keep seeking the things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Keep thinking about things above, not on the earth. For you have died and your life is hidden in Christ, with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you too will be revealed in glory with him. So put to death whatever in your nature belongs to the earth. All right. We're going to only cover one through five today. In this passage, there are two already but not yet concepts Paul is expressing. We're only going to look at one, but there are two. The first one is the Christian status, your status as a believer. Who you are in Christ is already but not yet. It is not fully revealed already but not yet. The other concept that Paul's hitting, which we're not going to hit today, we'll hit next week, it's Christ's kingdom rule. The fact that Jesus Christ will rule both in heaven and on earth. The fact that he will literally rule. That rule is established, but is not yet fully revealed. It's already but not yet. So Paul's hitting two concepts here. An already but not yet as to your status as a believer, and an already but not yet of the kingdom of Christ and his rulership. They're both already but not yet. All right, the two elements of God's plans have happened. This is the key here. They have happened, but they're still moving forward to an ultimate conclusion. And that's where we're going. Here's the Greek spasm. Listen to these tense changes. Now, y'all put your, your Greek mind back on. You remember four, five, six weeks ago when we did the Greek, Greek tenses and all that kind of stuff? Well, I'm going to give you the little bitty reminder of that so we can point something out. Remember the aorist tense in Greek. The aorist tense is, it is a completed whole, a snapshot. It's already fully complete. So aorist is the past tense, but specifically the event is done. It has happened. 
but you also have the perfect tense. It too is an event in the past, so it's also a past tense, but it's different. This event has ramifications in the future, implications beyond the complete event. So Aris is something's happened, it's done, it's over, past tense. The, uh, uh, the perfect is, yes, it happened in the past, but it's ongoing and it has ramifications for the future. So there's a different connotation here. Again, we don't see this a lot in English. We have to use different words to describe it in English. In Greek, it literally, you just change the tense of the word and it signals to the reader, that's what I'm doing. That's what's, y'all know how much I love this. There, what, what, all right, what's the verse you always hear? You're gonna hear it again. What's the passage you always hear at, at Christmas? Mary, say it for me, because I won't say it right. You know, uh, 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 in the fullness of time. In the fullness of time. Uh, okay. Yeah. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of woman, born under the law. So uh, pause. We'll go and come okay. back to this. Okay. But in the fullness of time. This is something that's really cool to me. If you look, what was going on? Y'all heard me say this before. What was going on in the first century? This is what I think. This is Joel's speculation. What do I think that when the fullness of time was? It was the time when the most expressive, clear language that has ever been developed by human beings existed, the Greek language. And the Romans had built roads throughout the entire world. So at that point, the gospel could be conveyed, and all its theological fullness could be conveyed with the most expressive language ever developed by human beings. And once the resurrection happened and the Great Commission was given, the apostles and followers of Jesus Christ could go to every part of the known world because the Romans had built a road system that covered the entire world and the Greek language was the primary language which is more expressive than any other language we've ever developed. In my view, or just in my context, that's what the fullness of time was, or part of it, is that when the time was right, and that's part of the time that was right, I just find that interesting. So that's why I love the Greek, is there's, there, there's stuff you get when you look at that that you just simply can't see it in just reading the English. Anyway, okay. So that's the two tenses. Verse one, you have been raised with Christ. It's an aorist tense. That means it has been done. All right, this is a completed event and it's passive because it was done by an external force, God. All right, verse three, for you have died and your life has been hidden with Christ. Now that's where Paul switches to the perfect tense. So all of a sudden, the part that is done and completed is you have, you have been raised with Christ. That's been done. You've been raised to new life. The part that's not finished yet is you have died and you live and, oh, did I miss that? No, that's right. And, and you are hidden with Christ. This has future ramifications. The fact that you have died and that you there is this, there's something hidden in Christ. There's a future this. This verb sentence structure in Greek gives you the already but not yet flavor of Paul's thought. Verse four, verse four, excuse me, in verses one through three, you get the already. That's what already happened. Either finished or it has ramifications. But now you get the not yet. Read verse 4. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you too will be revealed in glory with him. So see, now you will be revealed. Now we're doing something in the future. When Christ appears, then you also will, you will, you also will appear. It's a future tense. Now, here's the point. If you looked at this in Greek and you saw all these tense changes, the tense changes and the verb usage changes, here's roughly what Paul said. You are a new creation. You had a status change. That's the part that is Aristides. It happened, it's done. You are, and of course I'm pulling language from some of Paul's other writings, the, the new creation concept. You are a new creation. You have a status change. The old life is over. You died to it. That's that permanent death. But he switches the tenses. It's not a death that happened one time. That doesn't make sense at all in English because death only happens once, right? You die, you die. No, he switches tenses there. You died. Why did he switch tenses to a future ramification? What's a concept we all know? Because Paul then tells you you have to die when? Daily. Every day. So that's why in the Greek, a simple changing of the tense gives you a total different concept. All of a sudden, you died with Christ permanently, or you were raised with Christ permanent, done. Now, you're dying, but he's changed his tenses. So what he does, and you don't see this in the English, that means you're constantly dying. There's your sanctification. So don't be discouraged that thinking that your status makes you who you are and you're not following God's plan. It has to be a daily death. 
Yeah, it turns into a data. However, your ultimate destiny, here's the future tense, is not yet completely revealed. Someday in the future when Christ appears, that's what Paul's saying in verse 4, someday in the future when he appears, you will be shown for who you are. You will be revealed. That's cool. We'll talk about that. Mm -hmm. Already, but not yet. So all in that those four little verses and the changing of the Greek tenses, you get this already, but not yet. During your lifetime, and this is this is what what this is kind of the to me the most practical point of this. During your lifetime on this earth, okay, so you're in the already but not yet. Something's happened that's already complete. Something's happened to you that's not complete, has ramifications for the future, and something will happen to you in the future. And you call this the church age? Yeah. Already but not yet. Already but not yet. That is, we call this the church age. I, I, Don't I, I'm, not, I'm not gonna use it anymore. <laughs> It's the already but not yet age. Yeah. That's what it is. I'm not going to say church age. It's the already but not yet age. Because that's what it is. All right. Which we also call the age of grace. Yeah, we call it the age of grace also, yeah. Which is part of it. Mm -hmm. During your lifetime on this earth, you will experience the ramifications of this already but not yet condition. Here's the thing you need to know. You're going to experience the fact that you're in this condition. What ramifications? Here's where it boils down to. This is why you feel defeated. This is why you feel like you're not a good Christian. This is why you can't talk to the person in Kroger because you walk around defeated, worried, because you're still sinning. And what, what I'll Paul, say is, I'm not good enough. And what Paul is saying is, you're dang right, because you're in the already but not yet, and you are still in struggle with all that. It's completely normal. Yes. That's what Paul's telling you. Let me go to that. The struggle with sin, doubt, and fear, etc. You will struggle becoming the image of Jesus. That's the point. The ultimate conclusion is you will be made the full image of Jesus Christ one day where there is no longer struggle. That is when you appear, it's the resurrection of the body. Your body will be resurrected. You will return with Christ on this earth. And at that point, you will be glorified. You will share in his glory. Paul says that in verse 5. Mm -hmm. But until that day happens, you will struggle. It is totally understandable. And it is completely natural and normal, if you will, because you're fighting to become the image of Christ while you live here until you can be made perfect on that day. So it's okay. Quit feeling defeated, worn out, because you keep going back to the same sin. Fight it. Confess it. Ask God to take it away. But understand what he's doing is he's trying to make you the image of the son he loves. Mm -hmm. And that's the process you're going through. And don't see it as a defeat. See it as a slow, methodical process. Mm -hmm. And that's your job. That is the will of God for your life, is to make you that. So what he has you struggling with right now, he's probably, there's something in there that is creating a tiny little piece of the image of Christ once you eventually conquer it. God's working on you. He's working on you. Mm -hmm. it, it, it's the old image of the molding you with the clay. You know, you know, we can fill out a thousand images in the Bible. Well, that's what it is. That's what he's doing. Isn't that cool, y'all? Yes. Galatians uh, you will struggle becoming the image of Christ, which is what you're called to be, until Christ returns and your new status is fully realized. You still struggle with sin. This cannot be avoided because you are in the present reality, even though you have already, or even though you have already had a status change. Ultimately, it will be revealed who you are to everyone in heaven and on earth. That's what's cool. A child of God. That's what you will be revealed at in the end. Already, but not yet. You will be fully glorified. Paul gets that in five. Let's read Galatians 2.20. I have been crucified with Christ, and it is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. So there's your permanent death. So the life I now live in the body. Oh, wait a minute. I'm not really dead. I'm actually alive. And there's some future ramifications to this. I live because of the faithfulness of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Already, but not yet. Isn't that beautiful? So stop being defeated. You have already won. Go and disciple until he returns either for you or with you. We'll talk about this. See, he's either going to return for you or he's going to return with you if you die before he comes back. Either way. Isn't that cool? Can I share one thing about sure. the verse? Galatians 2.20. For some of y'all who may who been in, uh, who know him very well. I hope it's going to break up because that, that's Lee Cope's theme verse for his life. And if you know what Lee's going through right now, it's mm -hmm. not true. Mm -hmm. But that is his, that is his life verse. Mm -hmm. Wow. Mm -hmm. I hope, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, I can't even 
say that's about me. <laughs> All right, already, but I mean, here's here's a little concept. Already, but not yet. Y'all see how I shortened it? A, B, and Y. Already, but not yet is not just Paul. It's all over the New Testament. Let's read First John three two. Dear friends, we are God's children now. So we're God's children now. Yeah. So what is that? You see, we're God's children now, but there was a status change. Your status has changed. Dear friends, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet been revealed. How much more clear can it be? Already, but not yet. You're already God's. What was the first thing he used? Children. You're already, you are God's children, but what we will be has not yet been revealed. It's already. But not yet. We know that whenever it is revealed, we will be like him because we will see him just as he is. We will be like Jesus Christ will share his glory with us on that day. And on that day, you will image your Savior perfectly. Until that day comes, it is a battle and a fight and a lot of work to image him the best you can now. That's your job. And yeah, as Baptists, we don't like work. It's work. <laughs> it is work, and it is hard. It's not work unto salvation. It's work unto, unto being the very image of Christ, which is your destiny. So it is work, not salvation. Don't get caught up in all that. No, I'm not saying you got to work for your salvation. You have to work, work to out. image him. Work out your work salvation. Out your salvation. Yeah. With fear and trembling. With fear and trembling. Yes. Yes. <laughs> and some... Psalm 51, verse 5, I think may be some may have raised her tongue. If I see what you're saying, Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin my mother conceived me. Behold, you desire truth, not in that Christ, in the innermost being, and in the hidden part, which is just a minute ago, you will make me know wisdom. Wisdom definition is also Christ. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. And then if you read on down, verse 9, hide your face from my sin and blot out all my sin. Blotting is not a one and done. Blotting is a process release and then over time. So I think it fits nicely with what you're saying. Mm -hmm. That's beautiful. Wow. Absolutely. It's all in your Bible. Already, already but not yet. <laughs> wow. uh, where are we going? Just all right. So what is? Oh, this is yeah. So John just said that. So read three two again. But then she's going to add the uh, third verse, and you see what is John's response to this? So verse two, dear friends, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet been revealed. We know that whenever it is revealed, we will be like Him because we will see Him just as He is. So here's his response. And everyone who has this hope focused on him purifies himself just as Jesus is pure. And there it is. You do have work to do. Your job is to purify yourself day by day, moment by moment, every day, so that you look more like him. And yes, you will fail. Mm -hmm. And you will screw up. And you'll take one step forward and two steps backwards. And God says, I love you. Keep working. That's because that's your job. And it, it's just it's a beautiful thing. It isn't about guilt. It's okay to sometimes we gotta feel guilty just to get ourselves refocused again. But it's not guilt. You're not being condemned. You're being transformed into the image of the son he loves. Mm -hmm. ah, it's just a beautiful concept. And it starts removing the guilt and it, it sets you free to be a powerful warrior of Christ, which is what the subtitle of our class is. is equipping warriors. You will never be a warrior for Christ while you wallow in defeat. When you understand your role and the process you're going through, you will grab a hold of your job and you'll go to work. I guess that's what I was saying earlier. What I said yesterday is stepping out in obedience and and just admitting I'm a sinful person just like you are. I've been through a lot and by grace I stand here today. That's your message. Your message is I have the light. I have the truth. I'm just, you know, I'm bringing it the, the hope that I have. I want to share with you. I don't stand here saying I'm great and wonderful and holier than thou. And I get defeated if I think that way. And I get scared. And, you know, I don't want to step out and say something or be that kind of person. And then I realize, you know, I think, oh, they'll hold me up to some standard that I'll never be able to achieve. And I just have to say, you know, here by grace, I am. I mean, I can't do anything else but just to 
say what I've been through and the hope that I have. It's obedience. It's obedience. Oh, you were actually going to get through this real quick. I love it. <laughs> Verse 4, I've got it. Roman numeral 5. Your ultimate destiny to perfectly image Christ and share in his glory. That's your ultimate destiny. Let's read what Paul says in verse 4. Verse 4, he, Paul tells us the believer appears with Christ in when the state Christ, of glory. This is that future event. When Christ, who is your life, appears, you, then you too will be revealed in glory with him. So you too will be revealed in glory with him at that point. What does this say? This state of glory will mean a final transformation into the image of Christ. That's your ultimate destiny. Listen, we know this verse. Everybody knows Romans, Romans 8.28. And I, I hate to bash it because I use Romans 8.28. All things work together for those who, who uh, love and uh, 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 call according to his purpose. Yes. Read the next verse, and when you combine the two, you realize, oh, but what is his purpose? To be made in the image of Christ. Oh. Verse 28. And we know that all things work together for good for those who love God, who are called according to his purpose. Got that. 29. Because... Those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. See, right there. Every, Presbyterians, all day long, don't jump all that, talk about election and all, and all that's probably true. And I've gotten into all the Calvinism and the election stuff. All, you know, it's all fun theology. I don't even think that's what Paul's talking about there. What he's saying is when he you bow the knee to Jesus Christ, you are now predestined to become the image of Christ because it's going to happen. Yes. The predestined is you are it's predestined to become <laughs> the image of Christ. And on the day that you are glorified and return with him, it is done. I don't think that has anything to do with whether you were predestined to be saved or not. Anyway, that's me. You know, that's, I'm it's totally simplifying that argument. Saved. Yeah, I don't know. Because anyway, let's keep those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that his son would be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. Which is the point. We're all to be joint heirs with him. Here we go. We're all on it. Y'all know how much I love this. You have a destiny. No, you don't. Let's okay. see. Will it play? Will it play? Y'all know how much I like this. Uh, I'll set it to zero. Oh, and while she's finding it. Now, here's the question. That means you have to renew your mind? Well, here's the problem nobody tells you. How do you do that? You need some practical examples. How do you renew your mind every day? Next week, we're going to get practical and say, okay, we're supposed to renew our mind every single day so that I can image Christ. How do I actually do that? Next, Paul actually goes on in the next 10 or 12 verses to give you a bunch of commands. So he'll tell you. Start looking at this stuff, and you will renew your mind. Uh, know your destiny.
depiction of you could the be. coronation of the king and the establishment of you ruling and reigning with him, which is your ultimate destiny. Remember that, and it helps you fight through what you're doing now, because you're simply being trained for that. Isn't that awesome? We don't have to live defeated. You live powerfully. God the Spirit will work with you. He will help you engage the culture, help you engage people, and, and increase this kingdom and bring the family back to him, which is your whole mission. Awesome praise out here. I can't believe we finished. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for giving us the opportunity to come to become children of God, joint heirs with Christ. As we see in this movie picture, Lord, we can't even fathom what that means. We thank you for already and we look forward to not yet. In your Son, your precious Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.